Fabulous 2021, and no better person to help us kick that off than Dave Abbott. You all know Dave, his civic career spans many years and many sectors, from plain dealer reporter, county administrator, executive director of the Cleveland Bicentennial Commission, executive director of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, president of University Circle Incorporated, and since 2003, president of the George Gunn Foundation with an endowment of approximately 500 million. When his selection was announced in late 2002, it was said in the press release that he would bring to the role a wide knowledge of the city of Cleveland, good working relations with different sectors of the city, and a vision to keep the fund relevant in a changing world. And it's that last part to keep the fund relevant in a changing world that has really been evident, particularly in the past year as we have struggled through the pandemic. He's been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Richard, Richard Shatton Leadership Award and an alumni citation from his alma mater, Denison, which described him as a gifted, determined civic entrepreneur whose vision and passion for all things Cleveland is legend, and it truly is. His fingerprints are all over Cleveland's neighborhoods, initiatives, arts, education, as well as having inspired numerous individuals. And probably his least known accomplishment, which is often attributed to Kevin Stefanski, is leading the Browns to the playoffs. Because if you didn't know of those several thousand somewhat crazy fans who uh, populate the stadium in inclement weather and cheer the Browns on, Dave is there for every game. So Dave, thank you for what you're doing on behalf of the Browns, as well as our Cleveland community and welcome. Well, thank you and thank you for that. Uh, yeah, it's also a little known that I only accepted this engagement because the Browns declined my offer to fill in for Stefanski this week, you know, after he came down with COVID. But so as a consolation prize, I'm happy to be here. A uh, happy new year to all of you. Um, well, uh, I only have about 10 minutes, so I'll try to cover as much as I can in that time. And uh, I was asked to talk about what Cleveland needs to do in the new year to succeed. And as I think about that, I, I always, of course, think of it through the lens of the Gun Foundation, because our uh, foundation is rooted in Cleveland and we focus on Cleveland, but we always do it through a global and national context. And we don't uh, limit our purview to the boundaries of the city because we're cognizant of the fact that everything Cleveland does and cares about is affected by decision making in Columbus, decision making in Washington and global forces and things that are not beyond that are beyond our control. And so we always try to put ourselves in that frame of mind and to go about our work that way. And so rather than describe in any detail how we uh, approach our work, I commend you to look on our website and read a statement uh, we issued last year uh, called What We Believe, and it uh, will continue to guide our work going forward. And uh, it focuses or elevates, I should say, three key issues that we think are the overarching issues that we and all of you actually face uh, going forward. And those are climate change, inequality and racial injustice, and threats to democracy. And that doesn't mean that we have uh, gotten rid of our traditional program areas. We still have those in the environment, in education, community development, the arts, human services. We still uh, have that way of organizing our work, but increasingly we are looking to see how all of that work can reinforce the activity and the need to address those three major issues that pose such enormous uh, challenges to us, and in the case of climate change, truly an existential threat to humanity. And uh, those are all big issues, obviously, and they have many dimensions, and we could spend an awful lot of time talking about all of them. But I want to focus just for a moment today on the threats to democracy. And it's obvious to all of us, I hope, that what's going on in Washington today and what's been going on is, in fact, uh, in many ways, a very disturbing and uh, deep threat to the nature and even future of our democracy. And if we don't have a democracy that we have confidence in, then we can't address any of the issues that we care about, uh, including those major ones. And 
you know, we're just, uh, I, it's, it's hard to describe how we got to this point and how it is that we are in a situation where it seems that uh, so many members of the Congress of the United States are going to be willing to stand up and challenge the results of an election basically because they uh, don't like the outcome of the election and who will use as an excuse that there have been many questions raised about the election's integrity, even though it is the fact of those questions being raised, first and foremost, of course, by the president, that uh, has deluded many of his followers into believing there is some reason to have doubt in those elections. And then that will become the basis on which we will go through what ultimately will be a charade today, but is far uh, more than that because we are going to come out of this period with an awful lot of people who have lost faith in core institutions of this country. Imperfect though they may be, they nevertheless are vital to our ability to work together in order to make concrete, uh, reasonable steps forward to solve the problems we face. And we face, as I'm sure you all know, truly enormous problems. And we cannot address them if we cannot work together in some reasonable way, in a way that is informed by facts and based on truth and a belief in those and in the fundamental systems that underlie our ability to work together. And that's what's at stake, not just today, but certainly today, but it will be with us going forward for, for quite a while. It's not going to end today just with the resolution of the presidential campaign. And you might wonder, well, what's this got to do with Cleveland? Well. Uh, it, it, Cleveland doesn't exist in a vacuum, certainly, and so what happens nationally has a direct effect on Cleveland. But this problem with democracy and the threats to democracy do have uh, immediate and clear impact on issues in Cleveland. And I, I want to urge you to think about these things because going forward, there are things you can do as individuals and organizations to have an impact on the issues that we're talking about. So in, in the case of democracy, just to focus on a couple of things that have direct application to us. One is that this year, there will be a mandated redistricting of both the legislative seats in Ohio and the congressional seats in Ohio because of the uh, required every 10 year process. But there'll be new processes because as you may recall, the voters mandated that there be a different approach taken to how redistricting is done. It had historically been in the hands of a set specified group of elected office holders. And it was always uh, by both Republicans and Democrats used as a way to maximize their advantage in elections. And that's what we have today with the gerrymandered districts that make it almost impossible to defeat an incumbent where the politicians are choosing their voters instead of the voters choosing their elected officials. And we pay a price for that in many ways, but in particular, because it is a significant contributor to the extreme partisanship that we see reflected in Washington and in Columbus, and that makes it very difficult to get a reasonable action taken on so many pressing problems. And so in Ohio in 2021, we have an opportunity to make an impact on that and to start changing that by uh, having redistricting occur in a reasonable and fair way that creates districts where the uh, electorate is more um, diverse and therefore more competitive and makes it harder for a politician to simply appeal to a narrow part of his or her base in order to win re-election. They, they would be compelled by more competitive districts to be uh, more uh, uh, responsive to a broader range of the electorate and therefore make decisions that are reflective of that instead of just to the extreme members of either party. That's, it's a really important couple of processes as you know, that they vary slightly uh, based on whether it's the Ohio legislature or the legislative districts, but they allow for public input. They allow for you to create uh, maps of your own that you can suggest, or in a more likely fashion, you can uh, assist one of several organizations that are certain to try to put forward maps that they think reflect what need to be done. And these are not perfect processes. There is no guaranteed outcome that 
where we will be is going to be a big improvement, but it's hard for me to believe it won't be at least some improvement. But the degree of improvement that occurs will be a result of how much public input there is and how much people engage in the process and uh, demand that our office holders do a better job and then hold them accountable. So be, be on the lookout for that opportunity. Uh, it's not clear when it's gonna start. There's some, you know, there's new legislative leadership and they're already talking about putting it off, but the Ohio constitution requires them to have it done by September. And I'm worried they're gonna try and compress it into a very short time frame. but uh, be on the lookout for that because you can make a difference. And then the other issue I wanna mention briefly and something that should be obvious to all of us as an, a vitally important uh, opportunity for engagement is the Cleveland mayor's race this year. Whether you live in Cleveland or not, uh, it's obvious that the mayor of Cleveland has a significant role to play in the entire region. And there are frequent complaints, not just about the mayor, uh, mayor's job and the current occupant, but always about the nature of our leadership and the quality of our leadership and whether we have what we need. Well, frankly, we get what we deserve. And if we do not engage in that process, we will not have an outcome that we're happy with. The turnout in the city of Cleveland in the just completed presidential race was only 56% of uh, eligible voters. And that's terrible. And that is, uh, however, a reflection of the low level of voter participation in the city. Even worse was the last time there was a mayor's election, the, the turnout was only 23% perhaps reflective of the lack of enthusiasm for the candidates or whatever, but that is a, that's an abominable number. We have to do better than that. And regardless of who you may be for, and it's not even clear who all is gonna run for mayor uh, this year, and, and the incumbent hasn't even said whether he's running for reelection, but regardless of that, we must have a much higher level of participation because if we don't have it at the level of the citywide elections, then we don't have it where it needs to be on statewide elections or in national elections. And that's the bedrock of democracy. So when we think about threats to democracy, we start there. We start with that. And yes, uh, uh, distortions of the process, like the way in which money comes into play and is allowed to distort the process and gerrymandering, those are huge problems. But so is voter participation. And that's another place where you can individually and through your organizations make a difference. As I said, whether you live in Cleveland or not, you can uh, help volunteer on campaigns, you can contribute to campaigns, you can urge people you know in the city to participate and be engaged. This has a huge effect on the entire region of Northeast Ohio, and we have to do better. And so that's uh, another opportunity that we're going to have this year, and we really have to be about it. And so those are just two examples where we see flaws in democracy and problems with our democracy that we have to address. And with regard to the voter participation, I was uh, not shocked, but dismayed to see Rand Paul, the senator from Kentucky, quoted the other day as having said that about the idea of getting people who don't regularly vote to participate. He said, I'm very, very concerned that if you solicit votes from typically non-voters, that you will affect and change the outcome. Well, no kidding. And that's really what democracy needs to be about. There are many outcomes that need to be changed. And we will have no hope of that if we don't engage more people in the process. And so that's what uh, the mayor's race will provide us uh, as an opportunity this year. And of course, council races is part of that as well. And there'll be uh, elections to come. But we uh, do have those opportunities right now and coming and thinking about it on a day like today, where if we are serious about it, we'll recognize the true uh, threat that today's activity poses to democracy and the damage that it's doing then I hope that we'll be inspired to take some action and uh, to move forward in some constructive and positive way. So I will stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Great, Dave, thank you so much. And for everyone on the call, please feel free to add your questions to the chat box. Uh, Dave, to start, as you talk about voter engagement, can you share what uh, the Gun Foundation is doing to help reduce voter suppression or engage voters? Well, there are a lot of organizations, and I'll back up and just say that uh, we started, we've done a lot of this work for a long time, but we've really accelerated it in the last four years uh, as it became more apparent that uh, the efforts to distort democracy were systematic and uh, having a greater impact than we had hoped. And so uh, the voter suppression issue is, is complicated and a lot of it has to do with partisanship, but we are funding a series of organizations that are increasingly engaged in this work, starting locally. Uh, if you haven't heard of it already, there's a group called Cleveland Votes, which is a small but mighty organization that's growing uh, that you could reach out to if you're interested in personal participation, but they focus on reaching out to individuals to try to build their interest in uh, voting and to increase their capacity. They also did work on the census to try to make that more effective. And uh, part of the challenge they face is, of course, convincing people to overcome the barriers that are placed before voting, which change over time and which I think we're probably going to see an effort to increase in uh, the days ahead. And those are things like, you know, everything from uh, what it takes to register to vote and how you can register to vote and uh, when you actually want to vote, how you can do that and how many opportunities geographically you have to do that and all of the things that uh, are put in place by some to try to make voting harder instead of easier for people. Uh, but there are other organizations. Uh, might surprise you uh, to know that one of the leading ones in Ohio is the Ohio Environmental Council because it, it came to their uh, realization a number of years ago that if they did not engage in democracy building, then there was no hope of getting action from uh, legislators in Ohio or nationally on issues like climate change or many other less uh, you know, catastro potentially catastrophic environmental issues. But it, that it takes uh, a willingness for people to engage in the political process to get responsiveness from our elected office holders. And so they've become a major force in Ohio in uh, fighting for reforms to make democracy more responsive so that the issues they care about uh, can be addressed. And there's an organization called the Ohio Organizing Collaborative that is another one that works statewide to build grassroots engagement in local and statewide issues. And uh, so the issues of voter suppression, which are you know, varied and complicated, are embedded in their work and in the work of others. But it has to be we, the voters, who care first and foremost about that and demand from our office holders that they don't uh, tolerate that and that they don't um, try to impose those kinds of restrictions. So uh, there are many others. And it's uh, the organizations I mentioned are all ones that we fund but we're increasingly looking for new ones that we can empower to help fight those fights. You also mentioned the issue of gerrymandering and uh, a question around how the fund uh, might be addressing gerrymandering and how those on the call might become more involved to uh, address that issue. Well, as I mentioned, to take the last part first, as I mentioned, the processes that have been adopted now allow for public comment and for actual submission of, of model maps. So you're free to try to map out the state of Ohio yourself, but knowing that that takes uh, a certain amount of capacity and knowing where populations are distributed, uh, that's probably behind, beyond the uh, interest or capacity of, of most individuals. But those organizations, the ones I just mentioned, uh, are going to be directly engaged in the process and there will be others. And so you can go online and read about what those processes are and how they will work. Just Google Ohio redistricting reform and uh, look for those opportunities. Um, so there are ways for individuals and organizations to be involved. But you asked how also our foundation has, has been involved. And at the risk of taking too much time, I'll tell you just quickly that 
we, a number of years ago, started uh, funding the Ohio Environmental Council to work on this kind of activity for the reasons I mentioned before, that what they care about is dependent on politics being fair and open and reasonable. And that includes having districts that are not gerrymandered. And the, uh, the woman who heads the Ohio Environmental Council became the point person in negotiating with the Republican legislature over what the reform would look like because the Republicans were concerned that there was gonna be a statewide ballot issue that would go beyond what they could live with or what they wanted. And so there was a negotiated agreement and it was put before the voters with a, with a bipartisan approach and was overwhelmingly approved. Well, you may recall that Eric Holder the former attorney general uh, who joined forces with President Obama to really push for redistricting reform, he called up Heather Taylor Measley, the head of the Ohio Environmental Council, out of the blue and shocked as she was to hear from the former attorney general, he said, I've heard about what you've done in Ohio. I have to give a speech in Washington next week to a group that's concerned with uh, these issues. I'd like you to come and introduce me. I don't want you to talk about me though. I want you to explain why an environmental organization is working on redistricting reform. And she did, and it has had a tremendous impact. And there's now, especially within, within the environmental movement, uh, a much deeper understanding and commitment to working on democracy issues because they are so central to uh, the, the, what they care about in getting uh, improved environmental laws. And that's true across other issues as well. But I cite that as an example of how our foundation has funded uh, not just the OEC, but others to try to advance this work and some of the consequences that it's having. So has the Gun Foundation ever taken a position on an issue such as House Bill 6? Well, we are not legally permitted to take uh, it uh, stands on legislation. We cannot lobby, we can't take positions on elections, issues, or candidates. But we uh, fund a lot of organizations that do, and they're allowed to. And a lot of nonprofits don't realize they are allowed to take positions and they are allowed to lobby uh, within limits or rules uh, that they have to adhere to. But um, I, I can tell you that. I personally and our organization is uh, appalled by House Bill 6 and we funded a lot of organizations that fought to prevent its implementation. And we know what happened and we know where the money came from to create the, the absolutely appalling campaign uh, to make uh, House Bill 6 into law, although it hasn't been implemented yet. And I hope never will be. But that's another example of the distortion of democracy and the threat we all face, where you can have a company put that kind of money into the legislature and essentially buy about half the legislature to do its bidding to put more than a you know, billion dollars and more into uh, subsidizing two nuclear plants and as often as forgotten, two coal-fired plants, one of which is in Indiana and that that's what the ratepayers of First Energy will be, and not just for First Energy, will be paying for uh, from now to kingdom come if this thing is, uh, is allowed to go forward. So it's uh, an example of the way money can distort politics. And it's related to gerrymandering too, because those uh, elected office holders who voted for that law, many of them were in such safe districts that they did not need to care about uh, the consequences. And we can see today that you know the legislature still will not uh, throw Larry Householder out and they have not yet uh, taken any action to repeal the bill despite the scandal associated with it. And uh, it's there because they think they can get away with it. And frankly, shame on us that we've allowed that to be the case. But uh, that's a long winded answer to say, no, we can't officially take a position but we certainly have opinions in, on policy issues and we, uh, when it makes sense, uh, put our money behind organizations who can take positions. So in addition to the conversation around the threats to democracy and encouraging voter engagement, what do you see as the largest issues facing our Cleveland community as we look forward in 2021? Well, there's a whole lot of course, but um, you know, issues like 
job creation and economic growth and neighborhood development and education, uh, crime, youth violence. I mean, there are many issues that we face and you know, it's hard to say this one's more important than that one, but uh, those are all issues that we need to be concerned about. They're all issues that we need elected office holders who are smart and flexible and adaptive and uh, ability to rally people to fight for the solutions to those issues. And uh, none of them is an easy uh, problem or one that can be solved readily, but there are many people working on them and there are, every one of them can certainly be uh, improved upon and there can be progress made, but it takes leadership and it takes engagement of many people and it takes resources. Uh, but I, you know, there's, there's just a whole lot of things. It's in the nature of a complex place like a city uh, that you will have many issues. But, and as I've said at the outset, as we look at them, we sort of, we still look at them through the lens of these three overarching issues of climate change, racial inequality, and uh, democracy, because addressing those will enable us to address the others too, even as we're working on the others uh, somewhat independently, but not entirely. And climate change might not strike you as one that's, well, what's I got to do with Cleveland other than the fact that we're on the planet? And Cleveland has a tremendous opportunity that we do not sufficiently uh, take advantage of, and that's water. And the uh, access to fresh water, the availability of fresh water will increasingly become a paramount issue as climate change creates crisis everywhere in some it's to some degree, but with water in many places in particular, and yet we're sitting on a, a tremendous asset. We can turn that to our advantage, at least in the short and moderate term, if we would get our act together to do so. And that's, that is a sort of advantage, if you will, of sorts of climate change, not that we in any way want to advocate for it, but uh, it's an opportunity for us to both take uh, some short-term advantage and also to teach the world about what they need to be doing about water elsewhere. And that's a big set of issues, but that's a Cleveland issue in a unique way and that we have uh, not really done much with. What advice might you have for leaders across Cleveland on how to address these issues to, to find sustained change? Join forces, first and foremost. Recognize that everybody has power of some dimension. Every individual has power as the vote uh, and voting shows and as Georgia shows. And so find ways to build relationships with other people, other organizations and maximize that power. And then you put it to smart strategic use in elections to be sure, but also in you know, building the kind of power necessary to get action uh, in a political sphere or in one that isn't as political. And, you know, you, there's not that much that any organization or any individual or even any sector can do acting alone, but building collaborations is the way to build the kind of power to make real change. It's hard work, it's, it doesn't end, it's never ending. Uh, but it's what it's required. And, it, and I would especially urge doing it across not just sectors, but with people who are not like you, uh, because you'll benefit from the various uh, and diverse points of view that that will create, and it will create uh, alliances and the ability to have more impact than otherwise. Well, Dave, we thank you so much for your insights and your time today. And while there are a great many challenges, I have no doubt that those of us who are here on the call today and leaders in Cleveland can come together and hopefully make some real difference here in 2021. So thank you for that today. Let's do it. I'm going to turn it back to Marianne. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thank you, David, for your insightful words and inspiration as we start 2021. I know we have many great collaborators on this call, so we're grateful for what all of you do every day to improve our Cleveland community.